Thank you for joining us for this morning's panel. I've been asked to moderate. I'm Steve Colleton, judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit with chambers in Des Moines, Iowa. And I've been asked to moderate this morning's panel on the role of Congress in environmental law. As you know, Congress enacted several major environmental statutes in the 1970s, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act. Since then, uh, those have been amended in the 80s and 90s, but there's been not a lot of major environmental legislation since then. And as a result, policy making has shifted to other venues. The executive branch rulemaking has become prominent. States have legislated in the areas where Congress may have left a vacuum. And of course, lawsuits have uh, been filed to compel regulatory action or to challenge agency rulemaking in an effort to define the scope of congressional policy. So this panel has been assembled to this morning to address the state of affairs and to discuss more generally the role of Congress in environmental law. Is the absence of large-scale congressional activity good or bad? What are the reasons for the current state of affairs and what might cause it to change? What are the advantages and disadvantages of devolving environmental legislation to the states? Are there areas where Congress has enacted meaningful environmental legislation in recent years? And if so, what can be gleaned from those experiences? To address uh, these and other matters, we have a panel of experts whom I will now introduce to you. Starting on our right, we have David Schoenbrod. David is a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute where he's examining how Congress could restructure environmental statutes so that their objectives could be achieved more efficiently and effectively. He teaches environmental law at New York Law School. Early in his career, David was a Earlier in his career, David was a senior staff attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council where he led the charge to get lead out of gasoline. Since 2006, he's been co-leader of a joint project of New York Law School and the NYU School of Law entitled Breaking the Log Jam and Environmental Law for the 21st Century, a topic apropos to our panel today. To his left and my right is Nicholas Robinson, who is the University Professor for the Environment at Pace University and the Gilbert and Sarah Curlin Distinguished Professor of Environmental Law at Pace Law School. Since 2006, he also holds an appointment as a professor adjunct at the Yale University School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. He served from 96 to 2004 as legal advisor of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources and chaired its Commission on Environmental Law. In the 70s, he served on the President's Council on Environmental Quality's Legal Advisory Committee, and he was a pioneer in the early practice of environmental law in New York. He served as general counsel of the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, for three years in the 1980s. He's chaired both the Environmental Law and in International Environmental Law Committees of the New York City Bar. Uh, to my left, we have Matt Leggett, who is a uh, policy counsel at the U.S. Matt is pinch hitting, I'd like to add, and we're very grateful for that. Two of our panelists were unable to appear due to last minute conflicts, but Matt, is uh, here ably substituting. He serves as policy counsel for the United States Senate Republican Policy Committee. His areas of work focus on energy and the environment and agricultural issues. He formerly served as a legislative counsel in the House of Representatives where he managed a Congressman's Energy and Commerce Committee assignment. He's a graduate of the University of Virginia and the Vanderbilt Law School. And then to my far left is Professor Eric Clays. Eric is a professor of law at the George Mason University Law School. He's formerly an Eighth Circuit man, having taught for some years at the St. Louis University School of Law. He's written widely in the fields of property, private law, and constitutional law, 
His current research interests focus on flourishing and labor-based <clears throat> natural rights justifications for property in American property theory, in intellectual property, and in most uh, applicable to our discussion this morning, in contemporary regulation of shale gas exploration and hydraulic fracturing. So uh, with that, we will hear from each of our panelists with an opening set of remarks. We'll then try to engage in some back and forth among the panelists as they hear and react to the comments of the others. I welcome uh, your questions and comments as we get into the discussion. There's a microphone centered here. And so uh, at the appropriate time, we'd be happy to hear from you with any questions for the panel. David, we'll begin with you. Uh, thank you, Judge, for your gracious uh, introduction. Uh, and I feel very grateful to the Federalist Society for inviting me. This is my third time speaking here. And every time I come, uh, I find I come away with lots of ideas for my scholarship. It's just a very uh, rich intellectual atmosphere. And finally, I want to say I'm very glad to be sitting next to Nick Robinson. Nick and I <laughs> were warriors on the pro-environmental side um, uh, in the early 70s and, and, uh, in New York City. And I have not seen Nick. I think we were trying to talk about it for at least 20 years, so it's nice to be in the same room with you. Uh, of course, now I'm a member of the Federal Society, but he's nice to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so actually I have some slides there. There we go. Um, the job that Congress is supposed to do is quite different from the job that Congress does do. The Constitution defines Congress's job. Honoring the Declaration of Independence, let's see if I get this right. The Declaration of Independence premise that governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. The Constitution established a Congress composed of elected members who must stand for re-election on the basis of having revealed their roll call votes on critical matters of policy and in particular regulation. So that meant members of Congress would have to be personally responsible for the laws. Oops, I for, you know, it's so funny, I'm used to having the slides in front of me and um, I don't have these pretty things to show you. Okay, so uh, as I was just saying, the job of Congress is to be personally responsible for the rules of law. The progressive era had the unintended consequence of freeing Congress from such responsibility. Progressives actually did, or many of them actually did believe in legislative responsibility, but they also actually believed, believe it or not, that experts could use science to make correct policy choices. So they thought by setting up an agency, endowing it with power, insulating it from politics, the legislature would have done its job, or so they thought. Um, this belief in scientific policy making was falsified by experience, but the legislators uh, decided to keep going on and legislating as if it was true because that freed them from responsibility. And so, and, and that continued in many statutes <clears throat> down to, let's say, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, which was based on the idea, let the experts figure it out they'll know what to do. The wake-up call, however, came only a few months after the passage of the National Environmental Policy Act. Three weeks after the first Earth Day in 1970, Ralph Nader published a study which in essence accused members of Congress for manslaughter for broadly delegating. Um, Nader said Congress had killed people by ducking the hard choices. Congress responded by passing the Clean Air Act of 1970, and it did so almost unanimously. Senator Muskie said the statute, <clears throat> quote, faces the, hard uh, the air pollution crisis with urgency and in candor. It makes hard choices. And he said also, all Americans in all parts of the country shall have clean air to breathe within the 1970s. 
Now to back up these promises, or at least seem to back up these promises, Congress enacted a right to healthy air, but it also delegated the responsibility for imposing the duties necessary to fulfill the rights to an agency. Enact rights, delegate responsibility for the burdens. That's how it worked. And this allowed members of Congress, I assume I get this right slide at the right time, to claim credit and shift blame. They could claim credit for conferring the right to clean air, but then shift blame to the agency <coughs> for the burdens. And then when the agency came under intense fire from members of Congress for uh, imposing or threatening to impose burdens on constituents, uh, that meant that the agency often backed off, didn't achieve the promise of clean air on schedule, and for that, too, members of Congress blamed the agency. This is political perfection, is it not? Okay. Now, Congress has applied this method of shirking responsibility in most areas of environmental law. Now, whether the courts can stop Congress from doing this, it is dishonorable for Congress to do it. Now, Congress excuses itself by claiming that it lacks expertise. Yet, in writing in 1938, James, Dean James Landis, who was the New Deal's guru of administrative law and then dean of the Harvard Law School, showed how Congress could marry agency expertise with legislative responsibility. It could do so in two different ways. One way was the legislative veto, which we know what happened to that, but he had a, another way of going at it, which is clearly constitutional, uh, and that is to have the agencies propose the major regulations that would not go into effect until Congress enacts them the Article I way. In this way, I think I'm getting the slides mixed up again. In this way, uh, the agency would be the technical agent in initiation of rules of conduct, yet at the same time have the elected le legislators share in the responsibility for their adoption. Now, about 20 years ago, um, I was asked by some members of Congress how we could deal with this legislation problem, uh, this delegation problem, and I suggested Landis's approach. Okay? And the consequence was a bill called the Congressional Responsibility Act. I think it's time for the next slide. There you go. Um, and it got surprisingly big res you know, response, including some Democrats. At this point, some members of Congress got scared. We're going to have to be responsible. We don't want that. So what they did was they pulled a switcheroo. They come up, came up with something called the Congressional Review Act, which gave them the option of being responsible. And so that's worth about as much as, well, what some people say the vice presidency is worth, uh, which is just about nothing. OK. So it's toothless. Now, more recently, some members of Congress resurrected the initial idea behind the Congressional Responsibility Act. And they call their statute regulations from the executive in need of scrutiny or reigns, as if statutes from Congress don't need scrutiny. Okay? Now, their bill actually minimizes the chance that it'll ever be enacted uh, uh, into law, and that's for many reasons, but one reason is their bill's title. It stakes out the partisan low ground of opposition to regulation and distrust of the executive rather than the moral high ground of the consent of the governed. And according, I just learned from Susan here that, that um, it's, uh, people who rate these things say the, the current version of Reigns has about a 4% chance of being enacted which I think is probably a little excessive. <laughs> by, by sponsoring reigns but never having to enact it into law, the people who support reigns can claim credit for being for accountability but never have to be accountable. It's just as despicable, just as dishonorable on one side as the other. Um, in other words, they don't have to vote against agency regulations that at least some of their constituents think may be necessary to protect the health of their children. In some, Rains, the Reins bill is a, is a charade just the same way that environmental statutes as we have them on the books now are a charade. 
Now, I think there are problems with reins in addition to the title. I think there are changes that ought to be made to involve the committees, to allow a little bit more flexibility and timing and so on. We could talk about that later. The point I want to make right now, however, is that Congress having to vote uh, on major regulations would improve environmental law, and here's why. The statutes are obsolete. Here's a recent article in the New York Times. Uh, the most recent major change was a quarter century ago. That was the Clean Air Act, but that's the most recent of any of the chess statutes being changed. The structure of most of them dates back to the 1970s when Nick and I were hanging out and probably had bell bottoms on. Um, now, updating these statutes would bring more environmental protection at less cost, cost as shown in the Breaking the Log Jam project that Judge Colleton mentioned. Um, the point is that members of Congress lack any personal incentive to update the statutes because they shift all the blame for the burdens and the failures onto the agency, so why do anything? That's their point of view. If, however, members of Congress had to vote on the major regulations, they take blame for the burdens, they take blames for the failures to achieve environmental protection, and they would have a real personal incentive to get more environmental bang for the buck. In sum, Congress's failure to do its jobs uh, gives us obsolete laws and denies us the consent of the govern government. Shame on them. Thank you, David. We'll hear now from Professor Robinson. Well, thank you very much, Judge. And <clears throat> uh, it's great to be on this panel. I want to thank the Federal Society for the invitation and for sponsoring this uh, discussion, both about Congress and here about environmental law. And uh, although David and I have not uh, uh, jumped in the same uh, conference settings for a while. Uh, I taught with his remedies book for about 10 years, so I was intellectually advancing his uh, uh, thoughts on a number of these issues. I'm going to take us back a little bit in time <clears throat> to put in perspective where Congress has evolved uh, uh, on these questions of energy, natural resources, uh, and uh, the natural environment. Let me take you back to 1818, which is not long after Congress, some eight years after the Senate began its work. James Madison, uh, on May 12th of that year, delivered his famous address to the Agricultural Society of Albemarle. And if you have not read this uh, address, uh, the Federalist Society should read it, and it should be the text for our thinking about uh, environmental law. Madison uh, had been uh, 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 elected president of this society. He was past president of the United States, but he was now president of this society. And he was a leading exponent in his day of what we would think to, about today as scientific farming or the science of agriculture. Uh, a young lawyer, Francis Walker Gilmer, uh, took this address and on behalf of the society published it in June of 1818. It's been in print ever since. It's online. Uh, you can find it. Um, in 1836, in the eulogy that uh, John Quincy Adams wrote for Madison, he said, Madison had delivered an address which the practical farmer and the classical scholar may read with equal profit and delight. Uh, and it's still great reading today. In it, he traces what we have come to call the agricultural revolution, its strengths, some of its problems, uh, and he discusses concepts that are still with us in uh, nature conservation and in environmental science today, concepts uh, which we now call biological diversity, explaining the importance of soil conservation and the, the maintenance of soil health, uh, what he called the economy of nature, which we now think about as the science of ecology. Uh, he had a very focused discussion on the atmosphere, uh, and uh, they were discovering what is air in those days. They had re recently, had recently discovered oxygen as a gas and so on. And he said, air pollution, <clears throat> where the atmosphere uh, uh, breathed in cities and not, were not diluted and displaced by fresh supplies by the surrounding country, the mortality would soon become general. Uh, what he basically was trying to do was talk about what is environmental health, what is environmental integrity in the society, and what do we do to maintain it. 
Uh, he ended it with a very long discussion, detailed discussion, which was uh, celebrated in his day for how to uh, uh, be an environmentally sound farmer, how to make your farm productive, how to make the soil renew, how to do fertilizer in an effective way, and so on. Now, we fast forward from his day, from the coping with the early settlement and, uh, and development of a new nation and the uh, agricultural revolution, we jumped to the post-industrial revolution. And the Industrial Revolution came upon us with a great many benefits, but also a great many problems. We put off worrying about most of those problems. Uh, in Teddy Roosevelt's day, we were worried about the depletion of natural resources. We mistakenly thought that we'd cut down so many trees that we wouldn't have wood anymore. Well, most of the trees in secondary growth forest in New England, of, uh, northeast, have grown back. Uh, that was a a serious concern of its day, but one that if they'd had a longer perspective, they might not have worried as much about. Uh, but since, uh, and we put off dealing with the gradual growth of the uh, uh, externalities of the Industrial Revolution until after the Second World War. We had to win the war, we increased the pollution as part of the side effects of that. Uh, and so when uh, President Richard Nixon decided to create the uh, Environmental Protection Agency by executive order, it was not done by an act of Congress, uh, he basically uh, was trying to catch up with the fact that the people were angry about the pollution all across the nation. And that's when David and I were starting to jump into this business. Uh, we had to breathe the same air. <laughs> Wasn't very good in New York City then. Um, <clears throat> so. A process began of, of creating environmental law, which Congress has not been able to deal with effectively in its oversight system for many of the reasons that David has articulated. We've had a number of studies and critiques about how to uh, cope with the maze of regulations that's come about. We have some very thoughtful research, not just that of uh, uh, David and his colleagues, but the Property and Environmental Research Center in Bozeman, Montana. If you're not familiar with PERC, you should go online and get access to their studies too. Uh, and what I think we, we, we're trying to get back to is to distill out of this uh, arguably 40 years of experience with environmental law, but I submit to you it's longer than that. It goes all the way back to uh, Madison and thinking about the role of government and, and governance and the environment. And if you go back even further in the exhibit on Magna Carta across the hall, in one of the panels you will find a reference to the Forest Charter of 1217. Uh, this is the first environmental statute. Uh, it sets a series of standards which uh, Blackstone said uh, uh, was equally important to everything in Magna Carta. And it talked about the liberties of the forest and the rights of the people to use resources as part of their economic life. Uh, and what we need to do is distill out of arguably an 800 years uh, experiment with the rule of law and the environment uh, and come up with some basic principles that can guide uh, uh, both administrative decision making and uh, corporate and social economic activity. I think there are such principles. But as long as Congress is divided, and we had a very fine opening panel uh, discussion across the hall this morning, uh, for all the reasons that were uh, laid out there, we're not going to end the gridlock. So I think we have to talk about the consequences of the gridlock in the short term. And maybe the short term is another 10 or 20 years. Um, I think we can begin, therefore, to uh, look at compensatory action to deal with the fact that Congress may not get its act together soon. One of the things that's happened is uh, we're shifting the economic impact of the failure of Congress to address questions, not just from the agency, but onto the states and onto the public. Uh, asthma rates are increasing in a number of places around America. Uh, part of that can be due to the, uh, uh, perhaps uh, we now discover the uh, uh, strange behavior of Volkswagen. Uh, and uh, the uh, discharges from some of the automobiles and the concentration of automobiles. But what we, what we need to do is realize that that's a real economic shift. It shifts from uh, uh, the, all of us who have to breathe the air into the hospitals and into the medical care system, uh, uh, those, uh, those folk. Uh, there are many um, 
low-hanging fruits that could be harvested in trying to clean up the, the Code of Federal Regulations. But it's going to take uh, perhaps a process of saying there's a great deal of obsolete regulatory verbiage there which costs the economy a lot to think about. Uh, if we had a, a commission that simply went through the code, uh, not just the code for the EPA, but the federal regulations of most federal agencies now have a large section uh, on the environment in them. Uh, and if we were to just say, we could probably reach agreement on a great deal of the regulatory verbiage that is obsolete and simply needs to be sunset. Uh, let's put aside the things people want to fight about. We would do a great deal to clean up the system. Uh, as the EPA budget has been reduced substantially, it's about 25% less than what it was a decade ago, uh, we've seen the authority uh, necessarily shift to the states. Uh, EPA, uh, and most of the battle here in, in Washington, is about new regulations, whether they're good or bad or what we should do about them. But there's this backlog of, of stuff that goes back to the 70s. Um, and it's still on the books, and the states were required by most of the federal statutes to amend their state statutes and bring them into line with the federal system because we had to have a, a pattern of nationwide economic uh, uh, stewardship, if you will, of the economy and the environment. And so the states are now trying to make sense of what we do with the fact that we don't get guidance from EPA. EPA is slow to act on matters that come before it. Uh, there's a big backlog. Uh, and the, this uh, not only has delayed uh, dealing with things like uh, ambient air quality deterioration in parts of the nation, but it's also been very bad for uh, companies that have a national economic footprint. Uh, most of the companies that I've dealt with, large corporations, uh, have environmental uh, health and safety offices, sustainable development offices, they work to maintain how they are in compliance with all of these regulations through environmental management systems uh, that uh, work fairly well. But when the system has to comply with 50 different states policies or uh, regional differences that are now coming into effect because the states are doing things differently because EPA is doing little uh, and can do little about them, uh, we're, we're causing another drag on the economic recovery, the stagnation of our economy, uh, should be a high concern for all of us, uh, and maintaining stable and predictable environmental uh, rules uh, is good for the economy. Uh, the converse is also uh, a problem. So uh, we're going to have a long time of trying to figure out what we can do about this, and uh, uh, I think the panel discussion will be very interesting. Um, I tend to think that there is probably more consensus about how to manage the uh, and simplify the environmental regulatory system uh, at the state and local level than there is uh, at the federal level. And since much of this has devolved to the states, maybe we should take a look at how the states can advance uh, the reform system uh, in the wake of congressional inactivity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Robinson. Mr. Leggett, we'll hear from you. Interstate pipelines, hydraulic fracturing, clean coal systems, photovoltaic cells, nuclear reactors, America's energy power and technology. But in 1789, it all came down to the power of a horse to move a wagon load. Horsepower, the initial measurement used to compare the capabilities of a steam engine to the capabilities of a horse. To be precise, 33,000 pounds moved one foot in one minute. Today, we have additional terms, BTUs, barrels per day, megawatt hours. Like other policy areas we now wrestle with today, the founding fathers were masterful in crafting a constitutional framework which provided for the future without actually knowing what it would be or what they should call it or what technologies might be invented. As we all know, the Constitution set up a system of checks and balances. And within those checks and balances, 
It is Congress's job to pass laws and to oversee their implementation. It does so on a co-equal basis with the other two branches, the executive and the judiciary. One of the great things about Congress is that it is the most representative and the most directly accountable branch of government. A wrong vote has consequences come November. This self-regulating mechanism we call elections helps to ensure that Congress and the federal government strikes the appropriate balance when establishing national policies. Since the passage of the Clean Air Act, Congress has played a central role in crafting well-balanced policies that protect America's air, water, and land. Just to mention a few, the Clean Water Act, the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act, Superfund. The nation has grown cleaner. But today, when it comes to energy policy, Congress's contributions are blocked. The administration is taking unilateral executive action and ignoring Congress's role. In 2013, President Obama declared in his State of the Union address, if Congress won't act on his preferred environmental policies, I will. President Obama's liberal use of the veto, executive agencies stretching the bounds of statutory interpretation, State Department's slow walking of infrastructure permit decisions, EPA's power grabs, the results are clear and disappointing. Keystone XL Pipeline. The State Department said it would be the safest and most environmentally responsible form of crude oil transportation, resulting in 28 to 42 percent fewer greenhouse gas emissions than alternative forms of transportation. The Senate approved it by a bipartisan vote of 62 to 36, including nine Democrats. The House passed it too. President Obama vetoed it and recently rejected it again. Waters of the U.S. rule. A bipartisan group of 69 senators believe the EPA's new rule is not well-balanced environmental policy and needs to be rewritten. 57 of those senators voted for common sense legislation introduced by Senator John Barrasso to require EPA to revise the rule. 11 of those senators voted to filibuster that bill, then turned around and wrote a letter to EPA complaining about the rule and asking the agency to rewrite it. President Obama threatened to veto the bill, ignoring everyone's concerns, and unilaterally preserved the flawed rule. Coal-fired power plant rule. The rule violates federal law and will raise energy prices, threaten electric reliability, eliminate jobs, and destroy economic growth, all for little environmental benefit. Even Professor Lawrence Tribe, who taught both President Obama and Chief Justice Roberts at Harvard Law, said that this executive action was the equivalent of, quote, burning the Constitution. The Senate will vote on bipartisan resolutions of disapproval to block the rule as early as this week. President Obama is expected to veto them. In addition to blocking Congress's bipartisan actions, President Obama has aggressively pursued executive actions to wage a war on fossil fuels and natural resources development in other ways. In 2011, he retroactively vetoed a permit for a coal mining project in West Virginia that had been approved four years earlier. In 2014, he preemptively vetoed a permit for a copper and gold mining project in Alaska before mine developers even submitted an application. In fiscal year 2015, he leased a mere 2.8% of onshore and offshore federal lands for energy production. He has slow walked permits for liquefied natural gas export facilities. He has utilized his designation authorities under the National Wilderness Preservation System, the National Wild and Scenic River System, the Antiquities Act, the Endangered Species Act, and other programs and laws to block energy production on federal lands. His administration currently brags about its attempts to circumvent Congress during international climate negotiations in Paris next month. 
Congress is joined by other governmental bodies in protesting the executive branch's overreach. 27 states with whom the federal government is supposed to enter into cooperative federalism have filed lawsuits against the Obama administration's coal-fired power plant rule. Over 30 states have filed suit against its waters of the U.S. rule. The judicial branch appears concerned about the legality of the Obama administration's executive actions also. In 2014, the Supreme Court warned in Utility Air Group v. EPA that the EPA must not exceed its statutory authority in rulemakings. Justice Scalia, writing for the majority, stated, quote, when an agency claims to discover in a long extant statute an unheralded power to regulate a significant portion of the American economy, we typically greet its announcement with a measure of skepticism. We expect Congress to speak clearly if it wishes to assign to an agency decisions of vast economic and political significance. This summer, the Supreme Court cited that passage in King v. Burwell when it electing to base its ruling on its own reading of the statutory language instead of deferring to the IRS's interpretation of an Obamacare provision. The court demonstrated its willingness to narrow its deference to agency interpretations of federal statutes in the future. Also this summer, the Supreme Court ruled in Michigan v. EPA that the EPA acted unreasonably when it wrote its mercury and air toxic standards rule because it failed to consider cost as a factor at the appropriate time. The court painted a target on the reasonableness of the EPA's cost-benefit analyses. Last month, the Sixth Circuit issued a nationwide stay against the waters of the U.S. rule just after the U.S. District Court in North Dakota issued a preliminary injunction against the rule in 13 states. Last week, the Fifth Circuit enjoined the President's illegal immigration program. It explained that the administration relied on an obscure provision in the immigration laws that cannot be the basis for authorizing, quote, decisions of vast economic and political significance to an agency. It noted that Congress had refused to enact bills similar to the President's immigration plan. It noted that, quote, the President explicitly stated that it was the failure of Congress to enact such a program that prompted him to change the law. It found that, quote, congressional silence cannot confer on an agency, quote, the power to act. Despite the executive branch's overreach, I am hopeful President Obama will accept one bipartisan environmental pri priority working its way through Congress. Toxic Substances Control Act reform. After years of struggling to find a pathway, Congress is finally on the verge of passing legislation to reform TSCA. The Senate bill has 57 co-sponsors, including 22 Democrats. The Obama administration's singular focus on carbon emissions makes it easy to overlook other environmental problems, like protecting Americans from exposure to dangerous chemicals. It also makes it easy to overlook ideas such as what uh, Professor Robinson mentioned, uh, going through the code and just cleaning up outdated environmental laws. Thank you to the Federalist Society for having me today and for your attention. I look forward to putting some horsepower into the discussion. Thank you, Mr. Leggett. Professor Clays, we'll hear from you. Thank you very much to Judge Colleton for moderating so moderately. Thank you all for coming, and thank you to the Federalist Society for having me. Professor Robinson gave us a panorama survey of where environmental law has been, and Professor Schoenbrod and Mr. Leggett gave two different perspectives on where environmental law is now. My contribution is to talk a little bit about where environmental law is not really yet, but might be soon, and see what that has to show us about where environmental law is now. And I wanted to use my time to talk about hydraulic fracturing. And I do so for three reasons. 
First, it's a null hypothesis. It's an activity that's not really regulated significantly by the federal government yet, though that may change. And so if one looks at what's going on there and compares it to what's going on in environmental law now, it might expand our imagination about what the costs and effects are of current federal regulation of other things. Also, hydraulic fracturing in a lot of ways is a success story. One of the reasons fracking is regulated so lightly at the federal level is that counter to the theme of this talk, Congress chose 10 years ago to get out of federal regulation of fracking on one topic. And that's got some interesting lessons to teach about this panel. And last, it's a, there's a lesson here about the way in which regulatory legislation has a whack-a-mole tendency, that there'll be a problem over here and Congress stops it over there and then the problem starts. And, and there's some element in a, a discussion about a role of Congress about understanding how uh, Congress makes laws on different topics, and here in particular, the relationship between energy legislation and environmental legislation. I want to bring that out. So what I'll do is as assume nothing and give a quick and dirty overview of what hydraulic fracturing is, and explain why it's been an economic and a political success, and then explain how that success is related in large part to the absence of a really strong public law presence on, the, on fracking. And then finally, and probably spend most of my time talking about this example where Congress stayed out of the regulation of fracking at the federal level. So first, what's fracking? Shale exploration refers to the process by which energy companies try to produce oil and natural gas from rocks that are fairly impermeable. They're hard to break through. So in a conventional reservoir, you have liquid oil or you have liquid or gaseous natu natural gas stored underground in a self-contained unit and a well pipe can get at that and the pressure of the reservoir under not underground will do most of the work to pressure the oil or gas up to the surface. Now when a conventional well runs out, a party who is trying to get the most oil or gas out of the well can inject fluid down into the well to add liquid pressure to help the, the conventional oil or gas come up. But there's a lot of oil and natural gas that's trapped in rocks and not in big reservoirs. Some estimate that there's as much or maybe twice as much oil or natural gas trapped in shale and other tight rocks as there is in conventional reservoirs. So companies that conduct hydraulic fracturing have taken, it took them 20 years, but they brought together three technologies. The first was to figure out how to use hydraulic pressure not to just to create liquid pressure at the bottom of a reservoir, but to have the liquid act on the rock and break up or fracture the rock and get the oil or the gas out. Now, once the liquid had le leaves, there's a real tendency for gravity to collapse all those fractures. So then the second trick was to figure out how to use sand or specialized industrial cer ceramic beads to uh, be in the fracturing fluid and keep those fractures open after the fluid left so that the gas or the oil could escape up the well stem. And then last, the, it, it turns out that the best way to conduct this is not to have a single drill pipe going down, but instead to flare out six to eight horizontal pipes from a vertical stem to match the amount of volume of rock in a shale formation that's fractured. And th this, American companies worked at this and uh, didn't get it right. They started in the late 70s. They didn't really get it right to the, the, the early 90s, the late 90s. And so it was really 2000 that uh, fracking became a profitable, uh, cost-effective activity. So my second point, what happened after that, uh, there is one of the biggest American success stories. Many would say that the 90s was the, 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 it was the decade of the internet and the rise of the digital economy, and there was a huge creation of wealth thanks to the internet and the rise of the digital economy. You might say that the 2000s, I don't, I don't think that fracking had as much of a wealth creating story as the digital economy, but it's a significant story. Many think that the recession that we had wasn't quite as bad as it could have been because shale exploration was driving a lot of things. At, at the, by the late 80s, only like 0.6% of the U.S. workforce was working in energy exploration in the mid-90s that had tripled. Uh, the, about $50 billion a year is created in net wealth thanks to uh, the pr production of new shell gas. Uh, we can all look at see what prices of the gas pump are like right now compared to where they were a year ago, 
and that's because the bringing on of American oil and gas production caused a lot of Arab oil producing companies to see, want to see if they could kneecap the American uh, not unconventional gas and oil industry and see if they could ride, drive prices so low that they couldn't compete. And those low prices then let people have uh, cheaper gas, they can drive places they couldn't have before, uh, lower uh, energy bills for uh, your homes for heating, and, and then also a cheap natural gas uh, indirectly contributes to uh, agricultural production and to the production of a lot of things that depend on plastics. So my next point, a lot of this happened in the absence of strong federal oversight. And so what, and the, the American uh, shale production is in large part due to the, the working out of, without interference of the American common law system. In the rest of the world, there's, there's only four company, countries that produce any significant uh, commercial quantities of shale gas or tight oil. And they're Canada, the U.S., Argentina, and China. Canada and the U.S. are one of the very, very uh, small group, like one handful group of countries, where the mineral estate is owned by a surface landowner unless you subdivide it. Put it another way, the mineral estate is private property. In most of the rest of the world, the mineral estate is owned by the government, and for any kind of energy exploration to go forward, somebody needs to get a permit from a government actor or several government actors. And so in the rest of the world, somebody has to persuade the government and then the big existing energy companies, the environmentalist groups, or NIMBY landowners, that it's worth the government's while to grant the permit. In the U.S. and in Canada, some parts of Canada, it's the presence of the, the, uh, the, 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 the energy company needs to ask only the permission of the surface owners and get them to go into a lease. So then my last point, in large part, this is not regulated very much. In, in part, this is, it's a federalism issue. There's a lot of regulation of energy production by state oil and gas or railroad or mining commissions. But in part, this, there was a conscious choice by Congress in the, late two, in the early 2000s. The Safe Drinking Water Act requires Congress to uh, in, require states and, or Congress needs to enact, or the Congress requires the EPA to enact regulations and the regulations in turn require states to have different permitting or other regulatory systems for different kinds of in-state activity and these state regulatory systems have, are meant to protect sink or fresh drinking water sources in states. And it was understood when the Safe Drinking Water Act was, was enacted in 74 that hydraulic injections and during the course of energy production was outside the scope of the Safe Water Drinking Act. But if you look at the tech, relevant text of the Safe Drinking Water Act, it's tricky in the same way for those of you who know the Brown and Williamson tobacco case. In the same way, if you look at the statutory definition of a drug under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and you look at a cigarette, technically you could see a way in which the definition of drug covers cigarettes and tobacco, and it would took decades for the FDA to say, we don't have jurisdiction over tobacco. There was an argument like that to be made that the kind of injections that were going on in fracturing were, might be covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. The EPA, from the inception of the Safe Drinking Water Act to the late 90s, thought it didn't have jurisdiction to cover hydraulic fracturing. And it refused to make its regulations have special requirements for hydraulic fracturing. An environmental group sued the EPA to make Alabama institute rules to deal with fracturing for coal bed methane in the, in the late 90s. And the EPA said what it had been saying since the 70s. And the 11th Circuit said, Looking at the text of the Safe Drinking Water Act, we think that the EPA must, it has no discretion other than to change its regulations to cover hydraulic fracturing. And in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Congress took a, account of what, how the act, how uh, the Safe Drinking Water Act had been understood for, at that point, 25 or 30 years. The EPA in the early 2000s did a study of hydraulic injections and found that they didn't pose a significant threat to freshwater. And so Congress, taking account of that study and of its own understanding of the act, instituted a, 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 a provision of the Energy Policy Act saying that the, uh, the rules that the EPA issues for safe drinking water and specifically for injections aren't meant to cover hydraulic fracturing except when hydraulic fracturing uses diesel fuel. 
And so this had the effect of codifying the, what was, might have been an implicit understanding in the, in the agency and in practice and in Congress before then. But what you had the effect of doing is signaling that Congress should stay out. But it, for the purposes of this panel, that raises some interesting questions, because that's one place where Congress actually did make its will known. So what is, one, the question I want to end with is to ask, is this model replicable? And in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Probably in more ways, no than yes. It's useful to know that if there's a set, a, a, an, organized or an organic statute that needs to be overhauled or tuned up regularly, that Congress can make its wishes known by legislating in the details of the Tune-Up Act. Now, uh, that doesn't work so well, I think, or the, the Energy Policy Act doesn't provide the great model for a lot of the topics talked about in the uh, earlier discussion, because there you had an environmental policy be ma made on this one topic in a big energy bill. And a lot of the topics that the other speakers have talked about are big questions of energy, of environmental policy, and you're going to need an environmental <coughs> statute to deal with those. Another concern is this, that the Safe Drinking Water Act is, sets very high standards or very strict standards to make sure water quality is, is, is taken care of. But then in the details of the EPA's regulations and then in this implicit understanding, it was understood that the strict low tolerance standard didn't apply to some activities. And a lot of environmental policies these days, these days is made that way. There are tough standards, strict standards, but they're not, they're, either they're not meant to apply to all activities or the EPA issues regulations that exempt some activities. And a lot of the politics and a lot of the discretion that we're worried about is dealt with in administrative process to see what's exempt. And so here, the, I'm not so sure that the Safe Drinking Water Act model can be applied to a lot of other environmental statutes. And that takes you to the third point. You, uh, the, in 2005, I think people had, uh, there weren't a lot of people paying attention to hydraulic fracturing. And those that were were people who were seeing its economic success and its economic potential. Now, in 2015, we've seen the movie Gasland, and there's a very active grassroots movement to critique or criticize or delegitimize shale exploration. And there, there are towns that are trying to ban fracking. Of one state, New York's issued a moratorium on fracking, and now there are <coughs> members of Congress who are calling this exemption. I discussed the Halliburton loophole, and they're introducing bills to get it back. So fracking wasn't a polarizing topic 10 years ago. It might be now. But at the same time, this provide, even so that there is at least one example where Congress has been able to make its will known. And I think it should ask us to ask a couple of questions about environmental policy more the core of this, this, this panel. And one thing to ask is exactly the question that Professor Robinson asked. The Energy Policy Act was legislated because members of the energy committees in the House and Senate thought that energy statutes were overdue for a tune-up. And is it the case that enough environmental statutes, like the ones, the landmark ones enacted in the early 70s, are they due for a tune-up? Maybe it's the case that the, the obsolescence in these statutes is going to force Congress to act. And then the last possibility is, this is one, really the Energy Policy Act doesn't cover this. If that, if, so if the story about the Safe Drinking Water Act and fracking doesn't help here, I think that the thing, things that we have to think about is to ask whether the model of a of split presidency in Congress is the only way to think about things. Maybe what has to happen is there has to be enough political pressure over a long period of time that you end up with a one party, House, Senate, and President, and that combination of House, Senate, and President institutes an overhaul of the environmental laws. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Clays. Why don't we have some discussion, and then if any members of the audience wish to speak, uh, we'll, uh, I'll keep an eye on the line that starts to form there. But let me first uh, open it up to the panel. And uh, David, maybe you'd like to take a crack at the questions that Professor Clays just raised. Are you optimistic that obsolescence by itself will prompt Congress to act? Well, I would like to trump Professor Clay's optimism with experience. <laughs> um, the Breaking the Logjam project, which was, uh, I had a slide on it, an NYU New York Law School project, we involved in that project about 50 environmental law experts from across the political spectrum. 
and, and we had this uh, report. We had a book published by University Press. We went down to Congress. Dick Stewart was former and chairman of the Environmental Defense Fund, also assistant attorney general under Bush one. And I, we went down and we talked to lots of members of Congress. And what we got was basically this response. We think what you're suggesting is terrific. But you know, Congress won't vote on it. They, they won't want to do anything with it because they're not responsible right now. So it's better for them, their point of view, from their point of view, to do nothing. And you know, that's exactly what happened. I, I have one subcommittee chairman who said, I really believe in this. Let's work together to figure out how to do it. We had a meeting with a couple of senators and a couple of congressmen. You know, better wash my hands of it. That's what it, so it's a problem of incentives. And, and I don't think it's, I agree with Mr. Leggett that uh, Obama has been terrible in many ways, big overreach. But the fundamental problem lies in the incentives of Congress. And until they have to vote on the regulations, they're not going to do much. Well, if the public really shared Mr. Leggett's view, or does share Mr. Leggett's view, do you feel the electorate is not uh, likely to hold Congress accountable, knowing that Congress could, by its actions, override well, executive regulations? We know what the public thinks about Congress. I mean, the polls show that it's ter doing terrible. We had a panel earlier uh, where um, Professor Mayu showed data showing that the bulk of the electorate thinks Congress should be responsible. But the problem is we don't vote for Congress when we vote for members of Congress, and they always take the, the soundbite position. And uh, in, in what they say, I'm, I, I'm against killing children, I'm against pollution uh, killing, uh, 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 pollution killing children, I'm against regulation killing jobs, thank you very much, goodbye. And they get reelected on that basis. So until they have to vote on the regulations, they're going to keep doing the same old thing. I think if we, I, I, just, I don't disagree with that. I think that's been the consensus that I've been hearing through this meeting. But obviously that's not sufficient. Uh, we, we've got to find a way around that. And one of the pragmatic ways around that would be to take, uh, they're, they're, each of the 50 states have uh, associations of their own uh, environmental managers or regulators uh, and, and water quality, uh, sewage treatment plant systems, not your hot button to topic, but something we all have to work with uh, and, and make work. So if these folk, if, they're, if the societies that exist and have representation here on the Hill uh, were to argue that uh, uh, we think this part of the regulatory system and, and all the regs that go with it is obsolete, let's sunset them. I think that's, Congress can, can take a pass. They don't have to act then. They can just say, oh, well, if, the, if this is what the professionals think is appropriate, we'll just approve it. And then we could actually make some progress and move on and, and build the confidence that we can do that. So we might want to take a look at alternative ways of skinning the cat, so to speak. Mr. Leggett, do you have any reaction to that suggestion from Professor Robinson? Well, with, with all due respect to the professors, I don't know what Congress they're watching. This Congress, uh, ever since 2015, has been voting on these issues uh, many times over. On the Keystone Pipeline uh, bill alone, we voted on 42 amendments, which was more amendment vo votes than Harry Reid held the entire year before on one bill in two weeks. And many of those votes were on environmental issues. Uh, on the budget, we voted on many uh, budget amendments expressing the sense of the Senate as to what they thought on the waters of the U.S. rule, for example. Um, we just, uh, within the past few weeks, processed a bill on the waters of the U.S. and also a CRA. We'll be voting on CRAs most likely this week on the Clean Power Plan. There's a, a possibility of a CRA at some point on ozone. Congress has been very active in this issue this year, uh, and we have been very um, insistent on attempting to build as much bipartisan support as possible for these pieces of legislation. Uh, we have certainly made our views clear to the administration that way and in, in many other ways. Uh, 
Uh, and furthermore, I would say that members have been held accountable for their votes in the past. I think the 2014 election can partly be explained by uh, the votes of many Democrats in energy-rich states. And so um, I just have a fundamental disagreement, I guess, with your portrayal of where Congress is today. Well, let me let Professor Clays jump in, and then we'll come back, and then I know we have some people lined up, so we'll get to the audience quickly here. Eric? Professor Robinson mentioned one thing that I had been thinking about my, uh, before preparing my remarks, and I'm glad he brought up. It's the idea of sunset provisions. I think one way in which we could, environmental law might be made better is if environmental laws were to sunset, and so the deadline of an expiring organic statute were to clear everybody's mind and make them realize we need to update the, 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 uh, the, the statute and the way it's administered. And uh, Professor Schoenbrod wanted to trump my, uh, my sweet story with experience. I want to say first, he said Trump. Uh, I've got experts, and I'm going to have my experts talk to his experts. No. Uh, he's right that I have just one case study here, and also he knows far more about environmental law than I do, so if he thinks he's right, he's, uh, as between, I believe his experience over my dad and too. Uh, but on the other hand, we had to have something to talk about for an hour and a half, and I, I wanted, I think that there's some reason, like thinking about an example like the Energy Policy Act is worthwhile because it shows that, that there are some cases where I think Mr. Leggett's right, and I think there are some cases where Professor Schoenbrod's right, and if one thinks through the institutional forces driving each of the, the, the different cases, one gets a better sense of what, when things work and when they don't. So the Energy Policy Act, what was driving that was a sense that a lot of provisions of energy law, like having to do with the organic statutes for FERC were out of date, and these needed overhauling because everybody, Democrat or Republican, thought we needed to have a better energy grid and a better system for regulating energy. And so that, if that bill's passing and there are things in environmental policy that are germane to an energy bill, the costs drop at least in that context. So then Professor Schoenbrod's right that if you're talking about a lot of core issues about clean water and clean air, the politics are, um, in those subcommittees are definitely not the same and they're much more partisan. But even there, then, what came out of a lot of the discussion here, uh, it, or among the four of us, I think, is the question to ask, is if the Clean Air Act was last amended in a big way in 1990, and it was first en enacted in the 74, and a lot of the other environmental statutes really haven't changed that much since the early 70s, they're getting obsolete. And uh, an administration can try to circumvent that by trying to make policy by informal means not in formal rulemaking, but by press statements or hints to industry about what's going to happen. It can also try to make policy by doing a rule and tr like trying to litigate for 10 to 12 years and hoping the industry will fall in the line. But neither of those is perfect. Both can be circumvented. And the uh, EPA has been losing a lot of challenges in federal courts recently. And it could be that after enough pent up frustration with doing, making law by not legal informal means and making rules that get voided, even environmentalists might decide they want to come to the table and see an overhaul of the statute just to get a, a, a set of statutes that's more understandable and more likely to be where we are now, maybe. Let me uh, just, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead and then we, I want to go to our audience. Right. Cool. Let me just, Eric, let me just give you a couple of other experiences. One, Dick Stewart and I were trying to uh, sell the breaking the logjam proposals. We also met with environmental groups and we also, and, and as well as uh, Consul for Big Corporations, and they both said basically the same thing. The environmental group said, uh, we're for the reforms you're proposing as long as you prove to us that the environment will get better as a result. And the, um, and, and the, and the corporation consuls were saying basically, we're all for it if, as long as it costs us less, right? And actually that wasn't so bad if somebody was willing to take responsibility. Uh, because actually there is room for more bang for the buck here. But the point is that um, it's just so much easier to, and, and so given all that, how are you ever going to sell a sunset provision on the Clean Air Act? You just can't do it because everybody wants their guarantee it's going to come out right. And even if you did get the sunset provision, the incentives would still be to do exactly what they did the last time, which was to be for giving everybody their rights and, uh, and, and imposing no burdens. And yes, there are a few issues like Keystone where one party 
will be willing to take a position, but probably given divided government, it won't pass anyway. So I think until members of Congress actually have to take responsibility for choices like do you cut pollution 58 percent versus 63 percent, that's the level at which trade-offs are possible. That's where politics work. But as long as the issue was health versus jobs, there's no compromise, and that's what, how we got to be where we are today. Gentlemen, you've been waiting patiently, so uh, why don't I recognize our audience members, if you wouldn't mind uh, identifying yourselves, and then you're welcome to address the panel. Uh, Ilya Soman, George Mason University School of Law. I'm a colleague of Eric Quiz there. Uh, so it seems like if there's one thing that all of the panelists agree on is that Congress should take a more active role in managing environmental policy. But I wonder if that's actually going to be feasible to any great extent given the current structure and scope of the federal government when the federal government controls so many different areas, not just in environmental policy, but many others, uh, it seems almost inevitable that Congress is not going to have the time and expertise to closely manage more than a small fraction of that. So we're going to delegate a lot of power to executive branch agencies and the like. Uh, and it also seems almost inevitable that the voters are not going to hold Congress accountable for doing this to a large extent because the voters themselves have no idea of most of what's going on because there's so much of it and, and it's so large and complicated. So I, my question to the panel is, if you really want Congress to manage all of this environmental policy and other policy, regulatory policy as well, perhaps what we need to do is to reduce the amount of policy for them to manage, uh, that uh, they can't uh, closely control all of these things if uh, there's so much of it. That may mean making hard choices about which stuff really should be controlled at the federal government level and which can be left to the private sector or to the states. But uh, if you want congressional control, maybe uh, there should be less activity that they have to oversee in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Robinson, your reaction to Well, I think we already are outsourcing areas of environmental management uh, which aren't very controversial sometimes. For instance, the Department of Defense, is, uh, and particularly the Department of the Army, uh, is one of the best environmental agencies in the nation. They have a very good internal accounting system. They're very careful about it. Of course, there are mistakes, but, but they, they learn from their mistakes. The, the military is a self-learning institution. Uh, and you don't find great controversy about uh, how uh, uh, the Army complies with uh, or even innovates in its compliance with environmental law. Another example <clears throat> is the Great Lakes Compact. You may not know the Great Lakes Compact, but all the states that are in the water basin of the Great Lakes did this extraordinary thing. They adopted exactly the same piece of state legislation to regulate the uh, ecological integrity and water volume of the Great Lakes. The two Canadian provinces were invited to do the same thing and did. Uh, a compact was drafted uh, uh, and sent to the Congress. It was adopted by the Congress uh, and signed by President George W. Bush. It was adopted unanimously in the Congress. It was adopted it throughout the state legislatures. And that, of course, is a, 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 a self uh, management system in which, uh, with everyone's consent, the power devolved back to the Great Lakes states basin uh, uh, jurisdictions to manage the Great Lakes. Now that's a pretty good result, and, and the fact that you had unanimity in, in Congress uh, on it shows that if we have some bottom-up systems that work well, let's outsource it. Let's go back to letting it be managed in the place where the environment exists. So. I do think there are ways we are doing it right, and we need to learn from some of those ways. Any other comment on that? Yeah. I'm broadly sympathetic. I think that one of the best ways to do that environmental policy is to, to take a page from what, I think it was Governor Ricketts was one who said, but one of the four governors said that the federal government in environmental policy should follow principles of subsidiarity and yeah. local problems should be dealt with like through the proper like the common law property and tort system more comp complex problems local governments can do in land use regulation and states can deal with even bigger ones and then fo like focus the federal the, i think the federal government would be more successful in environmental policy if it did fewer things and then the only other thing i'd say is 
the in the short the in the long term the way that this needs to happen is to get rid of the political political ignorance about which Professor Soman has written so ably. Check his website for copies of his book. <laughs> and uh, well, we're good colleagues, like he said. And uh, in the in the short term, one of the ways to do that is to look at examples where the EPA hasn't done things so well, like the water spill in Colorado this summer, and try to use examples like that to make vivid to the otherwise politically ignorant voter. The, if the EPA is not doing well the core things that it should do best, what should change so that it has more time and capital to focus on what it ought to do? And Mr. I, Leggett. I think it's an interesting question to uh, ponder what uh, might be on the horizon in terms of environmental statutory reform. Um, there are clearly a lot of environmental statutes that are probably ob obsolete and need to be reformed. I guess one question I would have uh, in general for people to think about is to what extent have some of those statutes become obsolete because of their reinterpretation uh, by the current administration. A lot of their parameters have been pushed very hard uh, over the past eight years and I just wonder uh, to what extent the executive branch's uh, activities with these statutes has actually potentially made them obsolete. It's just a question to think about. Next question, sir. Yes. Uh, Ramon Bueller with Madison Coalition. I was a committee counsel for Congress for 14 years, and uh, I came in thinking we could change the world, and we discovered that it takes 60 votes in the Senate, and uh, limited government folks haven't had that in a long time. So I share, I think it's Professor Robinson's view, uh, no, maybe it's Professor Schoenbrod's view, that the RAINS Act is a charade because it's not going to happen. But there is an effort out there uh, that I mentioned in the previous panel uh, to do what states did when they forced Congress to propose the Bill of Rights. Uh, that if two-thirds of the states agree on an amendment three times in American history, the states have been able to force Congress to propose a specific amendment. And there's this amendment out there called the Regulation Freedom Amendment, which says that if a quarter of the members of the House of the Senate object in writing to a proposed federal regulation, then Congress has to approve it before it goes into effect. And there are 500 legislators who support it, 14, 15 state legislative chambers, including both houses of the Wyoming legislature, that have passed resolutions urging Congress to propose it, and the General Counsel of the RNC, four past General Counsels, the American Farm Bureau, a number of chambers of com commerce around the country have backed it. And it may be that breaking the deadlock in Washington can't be broken, can't be done in Washington, that it's going to take the states, who hate federal regulators even more than members of Congress, and don't care if Congress has to take positions. That might be the answer, and I'd be interested in your reaction, and particularly, Matt, because your boss, John Barrasso, has been a leader on this, would he be interested in talking to uh, people in Wyoming and us about being a leader on this Regulation Freedom Amendment effort? Well, I'm not going to make any commitments for our <laughs> boss today, but, <laughs> but, but we will certainly uh, take it into account. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's a very interesting proposal. I can't agree with you more that states are becoming more and more critical to uh, checking the power of the federal government, and in particular, federal agencies. Uh, we in the Congress often view that through the lens of lawsuits. And uh, it sends a pretty powerful message to us that a majority of states are actually spending resources and time, uh, many of them don't have, in order to bring federal lawsuits uh, against, uh, in particular, EPA actions, but others as well. Uh, so I think that this is an emerging trend that, um, that uh, will be interesting to watch as we see uh, cooperative federalism sort of, uh, you know, go into the future. David, what do you think? Do you think the Regulation Freedom Amendment could break the logjam? Well, um, I think that there was fair movement on the Congressional Responsibility Act in the 1990s, and um, if Reins was reformulated, renamed, uh, some provisions, uh, some poison pills put in there to ensure it never gets enacted, were taken out, I think there's a fair chance it could be passed. I think the constitutional route you're talking about, I, I'm not optimistic we're going to get what we need to get it through, but it certainly would put some extra pressure on Congress, so go for it, please. Yes, sir. Joe Cosby uh, from Washington. 
Um, it strikes me that an awful lot of the discussion in the panel and the questions have been about what the states can do. Um, and I'm struck in particular with Professor Robinson saying that the states are, uh, regulators are all very concerned about these obsolete statutes, but his prescription is to have them lobby more in Washington to try to get things changed. Um, my, I'm wondering, uh, particularly with uh, Professor Clay's presentation <laughs> on fracking and how you know the federal government just simply not being involved has been beneficial, um, is there an opportunity, rather than to come to Washington and ask Washington to change things, is there an opportunity there or elsewhere for the state simply to take the lead? And, um, and in particular, is there a workable model of competition among state governments to try to address some of these things that, that may actually work? All right, to, very good. Answer. Thank you for the question. Professor Robinson, what about the states taking the lead, laboratories of experiment and so forth? Well, I think it's a very good question and, and a thoughtful one. And <clears throat> uh, under the Supremacy Clause, if Congress has uh, tied up the power and the EPA or another federal agency issues the regulations, uh, the, the, the opportunity for creative federalism is constrained by that action. Uh, so when I was suggesting that the state regulators might like to suggest areas where the regulations could be dropped back and everyone agreed, you might even get the agencies doing it uh, because the pressure would be on. Uh, in the areas where there's no regulation, then I think states do innovate. We have a very interesting pattern of uh, states learning from each other, uh, uh, the better management of state park systems, for instance, learning how to uh, deal with protected area management. Uh, we have some very interesting innovations going on with one of the great uh, problems uh, in suburbia, which is the deer, where, where the suburbs, people don't want people to hunt deer. Uh, so the major predator of the deer is the automobile, and then we don't like what happens to our automobiles uh, or our lives. So uh, we're seeing some very interesting innovations to deal with uh, uh, wildlife management, which is not, in that case, a federal question. So uh, yes, I think, I think we need to promote that. Uh, but the real problem is that when the EPA sort of drops the ball because it, it can't function in some of these areas, the states have to then administratively fill in the gap because people want their permits, they want to move forward. Uh, industry is not going to wait for Congress or the EPA. Uh, so the state agencies are taking up that slack and they're doing it, I would say, ad hoc. There is no consensus about how to do it around the nation. So you, you end up, instead of a, an integrated federalism, you have a, a mosaic, a patchwork quilt of inconsistencies, which is the hardest thing for a a nationwide company or a regional company to cope with. We have two minutes till lunch. We have one more question from the audience. So no for an answer, the question will have to be quick. I'll make it as quick as I can. I'm John Hayes uh, from Texas. I happen to be both a uh, practicing energy lawyer, heavy in oil and gas, and also I teach a course called Energy Law and Policy at the University of Texas Law School. My question, picking up on the issue of the states, is, is not one of the lessons from the way the Energy Policy Act handled fracking, namely that the states can do the job and that federalism can work, and would not we be better off if perhaps the courts were a bit more aggressive in entertaining claims that we do not need federal regulation or national regulation, that it's truly a local matter, as is fracking largely. If there's any injury to groundwater from fracking, it's localized, it's not a national problem. And Perhaps could not the courts take a more active role? Thank you. Professor Clays, uh, any thoughts on that fracking question? I'm sympathetic to everything you said. I'm not optimistic that uh, 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 like NFE by NFIB versus Sebelius or Wickard versus Filburn is going to be reconsidered anytime soon. See what NFE by NFIB versus Sebelius. <laughs> Whatever it means. Well, thank you very much for your attendance here today. Why don't you join me in thanking our panel of experts. Mm -hmm. We're adjourned. Have a great lunch. <laughs>